okay. So in this session of numerical methods, uh, we will have a small topic on variance reduction. Yeah, very re variance reduction is just a big topic. Yeah, there are lo lots of methods for variance reduction, uh, and I will have a look today at control variance. So the section on control variance in the script is here just at the end of our section on time discretization of stochastic processes. But of course, it has nothing to do with stochastic processes. It's actually re related to the Monte Carlo method. Um, but I use it here because I will uh, later have a nice example where we um, value an option using the simulation of a Plexual's model um, and then do some variance reduction uh, of this valuation. But the concept is quite general, as you also see now from the slides. Monte Carlo control variates like to reduce the variance. So the topic is here, variance reduction. And recall that if we go back many sessions to our Monte Carlo convergence rate, then we have that the convergence depended here on the parameter sigma, though there was here sigma in this bound. Yeah? So our convergence bound, so the convergence bound, which is actually then shrinking here with square root of n for the Monte Carlo. Or if you recall the quasi Monte Carlo method with the cox malafka inequality, yeah, it was then the discrepancy. But also there, there was some um, variation of the function of x. So there was some kind of variance uh, in front of the x estimate. And here this variance plays a role and hence, I would like to have a small parameter sigma. Okay, so I like to reduce the variance. I would like to have a small parameter sigma to improve my Monte Carlo convergence or reduce the Monte Carlo error. So given a random variable x in the Monte Carlo approximation, we have here our Monte Carlo, say, approximation, take the average of xi. So xi was a sequence of iid random variables. So we go back to this inter interpretation. Actually, when we use it, it is xi of omega. So it is then just our random number, our sampling. Here in this general situation, we had the sequence of iid random variables having the same distribution of x. And then this time average is an approximation for the expectation of x. So now assume there is another random variable y. So here I have another random variable y. And I also have a sequence of iid random variables yi having the same distribution as y. So I can think now of a pair xi, yi, having the same distribution as x and, and y. But for the random variable y, I know the expectation analytically. So I assume now that I know mu y, expectation of y, so expectation of yi analytically. Then I can do the following. Let's introduce a random variable z. So now I introduce z and the z is just x minus a constant c times y minus mu y. Okay, so this random variable z depends on the constant c. So there is a constant c here. So if c is zero, z is just the same as x. But have a look. Since expectation is a linear operator, the expectation of z is the expectation of x minus c, y minus mu y. So is the expectation of x minus c 
times c is a constant, I can move it in front of the expectation, expectation of y minus expectation of y. So the expectation of this here is zero. So I have that the expectation of z is actually the same as the expectation of x. So if I'm just interested in the expectation, I can also use the random variable z. So if you now think of a financial product, instead of calculating expectation of v star, I could also calculate the expectation of some other random variable, which is constructed in this way, that I subtract another random variable minus its expectation from it. Well, this is a very trivial thing. So now I can approximate the expectation of z by the Monte Carlo approximation. So I have here one divided by n, take the sum over these zi. So it's the Monte Carlo approximation of e of z. And since e of z is um, equal to e of x, it's the Monte Carlo approximation of e of x. So it's just another Monte Carlo approximation of my expectation of x. So I could also use this. Uh, yeah, why am I doing this? Well, uh, consider the case that x and y are equal and c is equal to one. So what am I doing here? I'm taking x, I'm subtracting x and minus minus gives a plus, I'm adding the analytic value of the expectation. So actually I'm re I remove all the randomness and replace it by the analytic value of the expectation. So if x and y are equal, I'm just removing the randomness, replace it with the analytic value and taking the expectation of a constant is just this constant. So I have removed the randomness completely. I have, I have removed the Monte Carlo error because the variance of this x minus x plus expectation of x is zero. Um, well, if uh, you know the expectation of x analytically, yeah, this is a trivial case, but now assume that you know some random variable which is very similar to x, uh, then you remove the randomness at a certain percentage. And this may improve the um, Monte Carlo conversions because it reduces the variance. Okay, so let's ask ourselves here, what is the variance of this random variable set? Yeah, set as a function of C, yeah. So um, can I find maybe a parameter C such that this variance is small? Yeah? So I optimize now the parameter C to find the smallest variance. Well, since C is equal to zero, I have Z is equal to X. I can make the variance uh, less or equal to the or original one. So worst case that can happen is that uh, the variance stays the same. So what is the variance of a uh, set of C? Let's calculate it. So the variance of X minus C times Y minus mu Y is X times X is variance of X minus two times the covariance of X and C times Y minus mu Y. So this is just move the C in front, two times the covariance of X and Y. Okay, so the covariance of X and the constant is zero. Plus C squared, the variance of Y. Okay, so now I would like to minimize this. So find the constant C such that this becomes small. So you see if C is zero, it is just the same as the variance of X. So the variance of Z is just the same as variance of X if C is zero. And now try to find um, 
C such that this becomes small. Well, this becomes small if the first derivative is zero. If I differentiate this, I get a minus two times covariance X and Y plus two times C times the variance of Y. So cancel the two, divide by the variance of Y. So I get that the minimum here is attained at C star, which is the ratio of the covariance of X and Y and the variance of Y. Uh, so, you, so you see this constant C, if X and Y are the same random variable, covariance of X and Y is just the variance of X. And if they are the same, it's just the variance of Y. So if X and Y are just the same, then this C star is equal to one. And it just means that here, subtract one unit of the same random variable and add the analytic value. In the other cases, here the covariance models what is the part that is similar between the two and subtract that part. Okay, and we have that if the covariance of the two is zero, so if they have nothing to do with each other, then the C star is zero. And it just tells me, okay, you cannot improve it, just keep the original value. So in, in any case, I'm improving it or I just have the same as before. Yeah. So it is less or equal, the variance is less or equal than the original one. So I call now this additional part, which I'm uh, subtracting from the random variable, I call it control variate. And the result of this, I call it the controlled random variable. So let's uh, have a look at this. Yeah, it's a nice method to improve the Monte Carlo uh, conversions or to reduce the Monte Carlo error. And let's have a look at this in the context here of an um, valuation of an option under a Black-Scholes model. So I have now here a Black-Scholes model. So my model is DS is okay, R, S, D, T plus sigma s dw, some initial value. And I have an exotic payoff under this model. So here I have an exotic payoff under this model, which is given here. Okay, so how does this payoff look like? Let's draw a small picture. It looks a little bit like a European option. So here's the value of the underlying at maturity capital T. Um, here is the payoff of my option. So actually now I have two different strikes. There's a strike K1 and a strike K2. So here you see, I have two different strikes. So the guy looks a little bit like a European option. So if I'm below K1, I get zero. Um, if I'm above K2, I get S minus K1. Yeah? So it looks a little bit like what you get for an European option. So you get S minus K1 here, but in between it is a little bit different and it is the quadratic function S minus K1 squared. Okay, and to connect the endpoints, yeah, for S equals K1, it's zero. Uh, for S equal K2, this is K2 minus K1 squared divided by K2 minus K1. This is K2 minus K1. This is just the same as S minus K1. So it is just connecting these guys and it looks then here like some quadratic function and like this.
Okay, so I just invented this um, red line here, yeah, this um, exotic uh, payoff. So we have a somewhat exotic payoff function here. Well, and I'm too lazy to calculate an analytic formula for that. And it may happen that not even uh, there is an analytic formula. Uh, so um, I'm too lazy to calculate an analytic formula. I just throw it into my Monte Carlo valuation framework. Yeah, so implementing this function is just a very trivial thing. Yeah, just one or two lines and you have implemented this function and are, now you can value it with Monte Carlo. Um, now I would like to uh, apply a control variant. And sometimes control variants are just a little bit uh, an art, yeah? so which random variable do we know for which we know an analytic um, value and which is very similar to this guy? Well, um, the random variable I'm talking about here is the valuation of this option. So it is the V of T multiplied with the ratio of the numerators. So let's include this. This is my random variable X. And what I could do is just use the European option with strike K1. Because this is just an Plex Schultz model, Plex Schultz formula. So I know that the value expectation of Y is just Plex Schultz formula. So I have an analytic, analytic formula. So my control variate is the blue, the blue line. And what is, what is the right value for C? I could go back now to the slide and try to numerically calculate here the optimal C. We will also do this, calculate it numerically. But maybe I do not um, have this, yeah. I just have a guess. Let's take C equal to one because the two guys are very similar. And maybe C equals to one already does it. So if you do not calculate C, it's maybe enough to just work with a guess. Alternatively, you can calculate C using Monte Carlo estimates. Yeah, So you can use Monte Carlo simulation to estimate C. Okay, if you use C equal to one, it means that I calculate here the difference. Let's do that here, C equals to one. This means I'm looking at the random variable Z, which is X minus Y plus mu Y. So, and X minus Y, so this brown part here, is the difference of the two payoffs the red line minus the blue line multiplied with the ratio of the numerator. So in this graph, so in this graph, what, what's here is just this little function here. So this little function is now calculated with Monte Carlo. It is the part where the two guys are not similar. And then I add the analytic value for the European option yeah, using Plex Schultz formula. And you now remember uh, from our Monte Carlo convergence rate that what enters is the variance of the guy which we approximate and the variance of this guy is very small. And if you think back to uh, the cox malafka inequality, there was informed the variation of the function so this function here has small variation. So let's try this, this example in a small code session. So Monte Carlo control variate for a somewhat um, exotic payoff. So implement a control variate for this example, payoff function 22 here. So let's create here uh, in a package Monte Carlo control variate, um, a small experiment. So let's call this class Monte Carlo 
control variate experiment and I do everything in a single main method. Yeah, it's just a, a demonstration. And <clears throat> let's define a few parameters. Yeah? So I define my model parameters. So there is some initial value uh, for the Black Scholes uh, model. There is a 5% interest rate, my risk free rate. There is a volatility. which is maybe 20%. This is my model. Then I have a time discretization. So my initial time is zero. My number of time steps. Uh, well, it's an European option. So I just need one time step. You know? I do not need the Euler scheme at different time steps. And uh, let's have um, a time discretization step uh, of five because my maturity should be five. Yeah? Uh, so I just have one step to the maturity. So then um, I do a Monte Carlo simulation. So let's have 1 million or 10 million Monte Carlo sample passes. And let's have some seed for the random number generator. So this is my parameter for the numerical method. And now comes the parameter for the financial product. So the maturity should be five in five years. Um, then in my example, I had two different strikes, K1, K2. So let's define these strikes. Uh, so the strike number one, well, my initial value of the model is one. So let's, let's have the strike uh, just be around that. So one, and let's have the strike two around 1.6. So somewhat larger. Uh, now I use the building blocks, uh, which we have in our little library to build up the uh, random variables from our simulation. So I have a process model. So this is now my Plague Scholes model. So this is the specification of the parameters, mu and sigma. So this is a Plague Scholes model. So actually Black Scholes model, there are different implementations here. You have to be a bit careful. There's also a Fourier method, a Monte Carlo method. Yeah. So this is my model. This is now the Monte Carlo model. Consuming the model parameters. So the next guy is the Brownian motion. So the problem in motion needs a time discretization. So let's create a time discretization. Uh, I just use the time discretization here, time discretization. There are different ways of constructing this. And there is one with uh, initial value number of time steps. This is the guy which I like and my delta T. Uh, and he's nicely because I choose the name here accordingly, nicely auto-completing this for me. Then I can create the Brown in motion. So stochastic driver. So I create the Brown in motion. I use the one that here has a Mersen twister directly. Yeah, so I do not need a separate random number generator. Time discretization. Then the second parameter is number of factors. So that should be corrected. It's a, just one dimensional delta W, number of paths and the seat. Okay, these parameters are correct. So now we have the pound in motion. Okay, and now I create the numerical scheme. So the time discrete process from the Brownian motion and my model. So that here is now my Monte Carlo process or my process. So there I use my Euler scheme. So which requires the Black Scholes model specification and the Brownian motion. And then I wrapped this in my valuation model. So this was my Monte Carlo asset 
model. So this is now the Black Scholes Monte Carlo simulation model. Okay, so I just use this wrapper which we had in the previous session, Monte Carlo asset model from this process. Uh, yeah, so you see the difference between these two steps here is if you go to process, you just have get process value yeah, as a function here, time and component index. And if you now ask here the Black Scholes model, then uh, you have the get asset value, time and index. So it's just the renaming, but you also have the get Numeria. Yeah? So I now can just ask this guy for all the quantities. So now this guy provides all the quantities so we can value an option. Um, let's value an European option. So start with the European option. So every guy is now a random variable. So I specify now my underlying. So my underlying is ask the model for the stock at what time at maturity. And it is just a one dimensional process. So it is stock number zero. So in case you are simulating multiple guys, yeah, a basket, yeah, they could be one, one, two, three, four here for different stocks. So this guy here is now my S of capital T. So from my S of capital T, He likes to throw an exception, yeah. Maybe just throw the exception. For my S of capital T, I can now calculate um, the payoff. So let's calculate the payoff of the plain European option. So let's call this payoff plain. So this is just the underlying minus, so minus the strike. Uh, let's use strike K1 because my control variant is the one with K1. K1. Uh, from that, I take the maximum of this and zero, so floor at zero. This is my, my payoff. Calculate next step the value. Uh, well, the random variable, if I take the expectation of this random variable, then it is the value. So this is the payoff multiplied with the numeraire. Okay, so we need the numeraire. So let's first ask for the numeraire. So the numeraire at um, payment time. So this is also provided here by my model. So get the numeraire at maturity. And I also need the numeraire at evaluation time. So this is my initial time, the time zero. Uh, so now I multiply with the numeraire at evaluation time divided by the numeraire at payment time. So divide by numeraire at payment time, multiply with numeraire at evaluation time. I forget uh, about the Monte Carlo weights here because um, I just know that the weights are one. Yeah? So actually you should do it. Um, so I know now if I take the expectation of this random variable, So I ask here this random variable, uh, calculate the expectation and then convert to a double and print this. Then this should be the value of the financial derivative. So let's uh, run this. So this is the value now of the uh, plain option. Yeah? So not of the exotic one. Okay, so you see there's some uh, 29% as the value. Let's check if this is true by also calculating the analytic value. So there is the value analytic. So I know that there is an analytic formula. Uh, there is a Black Scholes uh, option value here. Yeah, 
which takes the initial value, the risk free rate, the volatility option maturity and strike. So this guy is maybe the right one. So the initial value should be here. The risk free rate, yeah, this is right. The volatility, the maturity and the strike. Well, strike is strike number one. So now I have the right parameters and also print the analytic value. of the perennial option, so I print this guy. So let's uh, check the output. Okay, so this looks nice. I have an error here at digit number four. Uh, well, let's print uh, the variance or even better, let's print the Monte Carlo um, error. Yeah, so there is a method here. So let's have a tabulator. There is a method in the uh, for the random variables that we can output from a random variable an estimator of the standard error. Yeah, so you can have the standard deviation, and you can also have uh, the variance, but now the standard error is maybe the guy which is nice. It's the guy scaled by one divided by square root of n. Okay, and you see this is some 10 to the minus four. So we are with the Monte Carlo around the fourth digit. Yeah, we are correct up to the fourth digit. Well, this looks this looks right. Okay, so you see this is the first digit where we see here difference between the analytic value and the Monte Carlo value. Maybe I just also print here a nice uh, little plus minus sign. So this is Unicode 00B1. So now the output looks nice. Yeah? So we have a plus minus, plus minus that one. Yeah? So that is now uh, my output. Um, this is the valuation of the plain option. So now calculate the exotic one. So we go back. So we go back here. Yeah. So I do not like to have the um, European option payoff. So here the blue line. I would like to have now the exotic payoff that has this strange quadratic part here inside. Yeah, so which has here this little curved part. Um, you see with Monte Carlo, this is really easy because I just now define the random variable, which is the payoff of this exotic option. Uh, well, how does this work? So I know that above K2, I have a European option. So let's take underlying minus K2, strike two. So if this random variable S minus K2 is larger than zero, then I have the payment of the European option. So that's just the same as this guy. It's just U minus K1. Okay, so if you look, random variables have many different functions and there's a nice function which is called choose. Yeah? So this function choose checks the sign of the random variable. And if this random variable on the left-hand side is positive, it will use the first argument. Otherwise it will use the second argument. And this goes path by path. Yeah, it's a pathwise operator, a very nice function. Yeah? So I choose now and I have the value of the plain one if I'm above K2 and below K2, I just have, let's have a look here, S minus K squared divided by K2 minus K1. So I just have the plain one squared divided by K2 minus K1. Of course, it's zero if I'm below K1. So I have, if this trigger is negative, I just have the plain payoff squared divided by strike two minus strike one. And this is the closing bracket for the choose function.
So this is the payoff function for this exotic guy, for this red, red line. So now calculate the value. Well, calculating the value is just the same. Yeah. So now I have the value exotic is payoff exotic divided by the numeraire at capital T multiplied with the numeraire at little t. And the expectation of this guy is now the value of the exotic option. So let's print this guy. So Monte Carlo value of the exotic option is value exotic expectation. And I also print the standard error of this, this payoff profile of this variable. Let's run the program, huh? keep fingers crossed. I believe I did everything right. So you see the value is a little bit smaller. Okay, that is expected because we get a little bit less money. Yeah? So, you know, this area here is now missing. So the value is a little bit smaller. The Monte Carlo variance is similar. So you know that maybe here this seven is wrong. So now let's use the control variant method. So the control variant method tells me that I can now improve this by using here this analytic value. So I now define the random variable Z. So this here is the random variable Z. So the random variable Z is now value uh, or say, yeah, value exotic controlled. Okay, so I use X, my X is the value exotic minus C times Y minus mu Y. So let's define some C. Uh, and start with the guess, the guess that we had on the slide, just start with one because I believe the two are so similar. So minus the value plane, minus the analytic value multiplied with C. Yeah, so this is now X minus C times y minus mu y. No? So this guy here would be the mu y. And this guy is the x. Maybe I write that here. And this guy is the y. Okay, and now let's value, so take the expectation uh, this of the value exotic controlled. So I take the expectation of this guy and I also print the standard error of this guy. Oh, let's check, keep fingers crossed. Okay, so you see the Monte Carlo error is improved by a factor of 10. Uh, this means that to achieve this improvement, you would have to use 100 times the paths yeah, because it is square root of n, convergence rate is square root of n. Yeah, so I, I, I would need 100 times the time to calculate this, to improve this. And you see indeed the seven is not correct. Yeah? There should be a five here yeah, because now the error is at the fifth digit. Okay, so you see that the controlled variable here is really, really improved. Yeah? So now I can, improve the valuation of this exotic payoff. If you go back to the slide, uh, I had here that the 
optimal value for the C is the covariance of X and Y divided by the variance of Y. Well, I do not know the analytic value for these guys, but I can calculate them by Monte Carlo. And surprisingly, this is also just a single line. And now you also see that it's very nice that we have this object oriented framework that we work with random variable, because now I can just ask the random variables for this. So I need to calculate the covariance. Let's go back. The covariance of X and Y. So X is the value plane. Ah, oh, sorry, uh, X is the value exotic. So covariance is value exotic minus the expectation of value exotic multiplied with value plane minus the expectation of value plane. And the expectation of this product is the covariance. Okay, so then I divide by the variance of, uh, so here I can, I can take expectation and I divide by the variance of, okay, so what do I need? The variance of Y. So this is the variance of my plane. So value plane. And there is um, a get variance. Okay, and from this, I take now the double value. Okay, so that is the formula here on the slide. Yeah. Expectation of value exotic minus expectation of value, uh, uh, expectation of value exotic multiplied with value plane minus expectation of value plane. And the expectation of that is the covariance divided by the variance is my C. So th this should be a Monte Carlo estimate for the C star, for the optimal C star. So let's have a look what, what we get. So our improvement here is 1.39 times 10 to the minus five, 392. Okay, let's run with this setup now. Okay, so you see, I get 1.38. So it is a little bit better, yeah? but the improvement is not very big. Reason is the two random variables are already very similar. Yeah, covariance is already uh, quite close to one times variance of the one guy times the uh, square root of variance of one guy times variance of the other guy. So um, it is already quite uh, quite close to the optimal value because the two guys are so similar. But you can use this here as a very generic uh, formula to really get the best uh, possible control. Given your guess for the random variable uh, y, yeah? because y is still a guess. Yeah? So that I used the European option is, is still a guess. Okay, so we completed here this nice little programming exercise. Yeah? And as an interpretation, recall that here our uh, standard error, so the printout that we did is directly associated with the uh, Monte Carlo convergence rate. Yeah? So directly con uh, associated with our error and also recall the Coxma-Lafka inequality yeah? where we had this um, variation of f in front. Yeah? So we, if we reduce the variation of the function, we reduce the error. And as always, you can look this code up here in our repository and play a little bit with this code. That was it for our control variants. Thank you.